I would like to uh, acknowledge my co-author, Margareta Jonsson, uh, from Sweden, and also all the uh, participants in Interact uh, th that have contributing valuable ideas uh, to the Interact process. I was given a wish list by the organizers of the, the conference, and I do apologize to them because I'm not doing that. <laughs> and the reason for that is I want to talk about the reality of the way networks are produced. And this is the reality. It's based on legacy of people working together in earlier networks. And here's an example of a very, very successful network which was held between 1967 and 1974. And the contacts here in this room with Gus Shaver and myself, for example, the contacts that were made during that process have remained today, almost 50 years later. And here you see people involved in IBP back in the late 1960s who became the fathers of other networks, the International Tundra Experiment, ITEX, the International Permafrost Association, IPA, SCANNA, Interact, that I'm going to talk about, and also the University of the Arctic. All these networks had their foundations in a legacy that uh, carried over from successful networking 50 years ago almost. Now, some of these people who were in the European arena got together and decided they were now leaders of research stations and they wanted to work together, they wanted to make their data more accessible, make access to data and facilities uh, more available, and compare notes on how best to run a research station. That led to an application to the EU for funding for something called Scannet. And Scannet 2001 was nine sites in the European North, and you can see a ring around the North Atlantic there with the names of some of these research stations from the High Arctic in Zackenberg to the Subarctic in, uh, in Albisco, and even to the temperate regions in the north of Scotland, but a complete ring around uh, the North Atlantic region. It was a four-year project. By the end of the project, we stood at 14 sites, and that's when our European funding ended. By 2008, we'd increased from the nine original sites to 21 sites with no funding. So we're obviously doing something which appealed to the leaders of research stations who found a very great benefit in having a forum to meet together. The total funds for Scanet from the EU during our initial period were 900,000 euros. And this is something that I think people ought to think about when we're discussing future Arctic observant, observing systems and international funding that there is huge investment already in the infrastructures, national investment in the infrastructures. To pull them together takes relatively little funding. So here you see we did a lot for less than 1 million euros. Between 2005 and 2009, when we grew dramatically, the total budget was zero. We grew without any money. But because we had grown a lot, by 2010 we put in a new application to the EU and Framework 7 infrastructure uh, program funded us, and by that time, 2010, we were 33 partners in 19 countries. Just two years later, we have what we call observer stations, we have more than 22, and as I stand here today, we're over 50 research stations, and when I go home next week, we have three applications from Russian research stations who want to join. We are multidisciplinary, so we're not a single discipline network. We are an infrastructure that hosts numerous disciplines and numerous single disciplinary networks. So we host research and observations on biodiversity, glaciology, permafrost, climate, hydrology, ecology, biogeochemistry, human dimension, etc. And we are arranged into programs which are funded by the EU to allow transnational access. That's a fund to allow researchers from anywhere, so long as they have an EU connection, to go to one of 20 research stations. We also have a station managers forum and joint research activities and outreach, and I'll describe those a little bit later. Now then, we have a vision, or is it a vision, or is it just serendipity, chance? But if we look at an environmental envelope of the Arctic, we can put two axes there, up, one's upside down, that's mean annual temperature, cold at the top, warm at the bottom, and on the bottom axis we have mean annual precipitation. And on there you see environmental thresholds, the thresholds above which you have glaciers and below which you don't have glaciers, the thresholds for different types of permafrost, the various boundaries between different vegetation types. And if you look at our large network, 
and this diagram is 45 research stations, so it's not completely up to date. We represent a strategic sampling regime for the whole environmental envelope of the Arctic and the northern regions. And if you take any one of those dots on the map, which is a central location for a research station, each of those comes within its own environmental envelope, from the warm valleys to the cold mountain tops. So we cover space between the research stations as well. Now, in terms of designing a network, I, have, I would love to say that we designed the network to fill this environmental gradient. We didn't. We just had so many research stations that we found by chance that we filled this environmental gradient. That was a starting point two years ago. If we now move on, we have a very nice paper by Xu et al. Uh, in Nature Climate Change just a few weeks ago, and that plots the greening of the Arctic. It's an NDVI proxy uh, for plant productivity and how that's changed in the last 30 years. And what you begin to see is you can plot the distribution of research stations, infrastructures, on the changes. So not only do we represent um, a sampling framework for uh, the, the whole environmental envelope, we also represent a sampling framework for change, at least in ecosystems of the Arctic. Each of the pixels in that uh, pan-Arctic view are 12 kilometers, and we can follow those areas of no change at a particular research station, for example, Disco Island, West Greenland, and look at what has happened over the past 30 years, because there's a research station there. We can also look at another area which is characteristic of change in northern Sweden, in Orbisco, and then again look at what's happened on the ground over the last 30 years and see quite dramatic change. So we have a validation system for remotely sensed information because we have a comprehensive uh, network. What these satellite images show us is huge complexity in responses. Only 37% of the Arctic has significantly responded, 63% has not. Now, when we go down to one of the research stations, I cheated by showing a research station and an example of change. But if we go down to an individual research station, like the Orbisco station, in fact, that is a network in itself. It has its local network of observations and research that go back over 100 years. This is a complex graphic. I'm not going to uh, go into it in detail, but every graphic on this map in a GIS framework represents a multi-decadal data set, sometimes going back 100 years, of ecosystem change. So every one of those graphics is a summary of a very large project. And I'll just show you some examples of complexity. This is tree line going up. This is tree line going up a little bit. This is tree line going down. This is tree line staying where it has been for 100 years. So the complexity we see at the panarctic scale, we also see at the local scale. Now, I would like to tell you that all that research, that vast amount of research by dozens of research groups, was planned. It wasn't. And the information that goes into that synthesis is repeat photography, site revisits, data rescue from old reports, PhD theses, control plots of long-term experiments, tree ring analyses, and at the bottom there you see designed monitoring. And the design monitoring is a very small component of the design of all this information that we have available to us. We have to attribute some of that, that, those changes we see to causes. And one way we can do that is get local knowledge and put it together with science knowledge to look at land use. And the top graphic there is a GIS structure of land use changes over the past 100 years. And this is derived from local and science knowledge. We also are overwhelmed by thinking of, of trends, long-term trends. But in fact, the way systems change is very often by events. The graphic over here is all the events we see in this area, whether they're insect outbreaks, introduction of moose, uh, lemming population peaks, slush avalanches, um, etc. And the backdrop is 50 meter level resolution uh, climate ch uh, change over 100 years. On the right, we have the abiotic changes, permafrost uh, trends over 30 years, snow, uh, temperature, lake ice, etc., etc. I would like to make the point that this scale, which is one dot 
uh, a mini network within the Interact framework is providing information which is relevant to local peoples who need this high resolution data to be able to understand changes where they live and to be able to adapt. And our dream, of course, is to provide this information for every site within Interact. Now, that example of serendipity, if you like, and uh, it, it applies to a long-term uh, platform that's been running for 100 years. There are other research data, we heard a lot about Charles in the, uh, that's being developed in Canada, and we have Zuckerberg that's been running for just over 10 years in Northeast Greenland. They have the wonderful ability to design a monitoring structure from ground zero. And here you see a, an extremely um, uh, effective monitoring program developed from the start by the Zuckerberg program, and uh, I won't go into detail about that, but just advise you to look at it in terms of design of a, a system. Now, one point I've been made at the working group several times, so I apologize for repeating myself yet again, is that observing is irrelevant if we don't know what the causes are behind the changes we observe. If we know what the causes are, we can then help managers to manage the system. And there are two ways of attributing causes, or two main ways. One is to carry out experiments. Here you see a whole range of experiments uh, on snow, CO2, etc., UVB, um, that are hosted by Interact sites. Here are experiments that are hosted, also hosted by Interact sites on uh, the biological causes of some of the changes we see. These are herbivore exposures, keeping rodents out, keeping reindeer out, or removing competitor tree species. So we need observation, we need attribution, and the next stage is projection. So if we have observation attribution, we can then go to projection. So we can go from our observations and validation for 100 years ago, and we can go for the, uh, into the next 100 years. The top graphic just shows you the, the, the growth of birch forest over a 100 period of, oh, it's 200 years, one of observed, uh, one of uh, projected uh, expansion of birch forest. That's a scaling opportunity in time, once we have the observation, the attribution. But in terms of space, we can move from the individual research station information for local adaptation all the way through to the network level syntheses, which give us information that is relevant to the global community. And the best example are the feedbacks, the feedbacks from energy exchange or uh, carbon emissions, which only make sense when you synthesize at the panarctic level and they have global implications then. Now, going into a little bit more detail about some of the rationale behind Interact, one thing that we have to remember is that we are platforms, and we are stable platforms. So no one is allowed in Interact unless they have multi-decadal stability, uh, are multidisciplinary, and um, offer uh, places for guest scientists. So together, we host thousands of researchers from all over the world. And we participate in all the major um, circumarctic uh, processes and many of the EU-supported processes. Um, we basically provide services and infrastructure for the whole of the Arctic, where observing capacity is currently low. And we've been running for 100 years. Some of the, the services we provide are ground validation, remote sensing, model testing on the ground, hosting standardized experiments, hosting observation sampling networks, sampling and inventorying, building capacity for education, and rapid response sampling of Arctic-wide. One email will reach over 50 research stations to ask for samples or observations. Transnational access is a way of putting researchers into the field to help with the attribution and to help build the observing networks uh, and to modernize them by introducing new technology, new topics, to, and new research questions. And if you look here, we together offer something like 10,000 days to researchers. In the first 18 months, we had applications for over 9,000 days. Uh, groups from 19 countries applying. We granted 5,400 days. And we have put 360 researchers into the field paying for their travel and subsistence to 20 research stations. We have opened up for the very first time EU funding for access to Russian research stations. That has never been done before, but we have a really good working system, and we have more Russian research stations coming on board. When the Canadian sites and the first, site, uh, first sites were in the CEN network, led by Warwick Vincent here, uh, they contributed transnational access funding from Canada. 
So we now have access to Russia, to Europe, to Canada. And at the last IAS meeting, we had an, an undertaking from NSF to contribute to that meeting. So in terms of now international funding, we think for the very first time, we have one pot of money for scientists to apply for to go to any Arctic country. We have something called joint research activities. We're not allowed to do pure research. So we do that by, in two ways. One is by working with and supporting other projects that are specifically doing research, short-term research. But also we can improve, we can do research that helps us to improve our monitoring. And here's one example. We talked to the climate modelers and asked, asked what they needed. It was looking at uh, energy exchange and we built partial ICOS stations. ICOS is Integrated Carbon Observing System. And we helped ICOS by putting up these stations where they didn't exist. And once these stations were put up in many of our sites, other sites could then go for national funding, leverage that national funding to belong to this single disciplinary network hosted by our interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary uh, platforms. We have something called a station managers forum. This is where all the managers of all the infrastructures come together and talk to together about how they can best design research and monitoring programs, safety issues, education and training, and how in general they can improve their services to the research community and the stakeholders. One thing that we have done already, we have many products on the way. The first product, which has been a big success, is a station catalogue. And you heard Director Inouye in one of his three priorities this morning say he wanted a list of research stations. Here it is. This is a good start. In this catalogue, there are 45 research stations. And it will be updated soon with, we estimate, about 60 uh, research stations. And in there, it's a travel guide for researchers who wish to work in the Arctic. So all the connections are there and the descriptions of the various stations. Soon we will match that publication with a metadata base of all the research projects and monitoring activities going back until the year 2000 at all these research stations. And I just covered that. We also are very active in outreach and on the first day of the meeting we heard someone say it's really rather uh, irrelevant to do the observing unless you can get at it on the, the phone, the mobile phone. So here you see Twitter, Facebook, and Arctic research blogs, which are all available to the, the international community and to schools. At present, we're talking with the uh, Teachers Association, which consists of 30 countries, and they are giving us input on what they need, what the teaching community needs from the Arctic community. So we are reaching out. And my final slide is that we have been invited by our project officer very kindly to apply uh, for Interact 2. Uh, we are part of Horizon 2020. Of course, there are no guarantees that we will be successful, but we will try. And at this very moment in time, we are planning Interact 2. There will be some core activities which will be continued, the coordination, the networking, the station managers forum. By Interact 2 in two years' time, we could be at 80 research stations. And, of course, transnational access will increase and it will be pan-Arctic. We will also continue with our outreach and we hope to develop a better relationship with community-based monitoring. But then the joint research activities, they will change from Interact 1. And there are many ideas floating around. But we're hoping that Back to the Future 2, I, which is a, a data recovery exercise and uh, communication between young generations and old generations researchers, could be hosted uh, within Interact the Arctic Biodiversity Coalition uh, could also be hosted within, uh, within uh, Interact 2, but perhaps uh, led by Canada and funded by Canada. CBMP, we already have a very strong dialogue, dialogue with CBMP Terrestrial Working Group. Some of their planned monitoring activities will be at research stations, and hopefully together we will develop a work package to enable us to get the necessary resources to enable CMP research to be done at our research stations. Another one is, I haven't talked about data, it's a can of worms and I've tried to avoid it, but what we would like is instead of reinventing the wheel and doing our own thing on data uh, management and data policy, we would welcome a very, very close connection with Seon. So instead of producing our own data and then transforming it into what Seon wants, we'd like it to go directly into Seon. 
So those are the examples of what we would like to do, but we will have a meeting at half past five in the Balmoral Room, which is an open meeting, and we will welcome anyone who would like to use Interact. We, should, we are not a selfish organisation. We are facilitators. We are managers of infrastructures. Although we've done a lot, we still have enormous capacity that isn't used. We have the major infrastructure costs covered. It costs very little to make an extra observation or to provide an extra service for someone. So if you're interested in seeing what we can do to help you, please come along to that meeting. And my final comment is this slide, which uh, perhaps you haven't seen before. It's not been published. It was derived from the Jus et al. paper, which dealt with seasonality of climate warming over the past 30 years and um, seasonality of vegetation change. And what I'd like to point out, I asked, derived two statistics from this database. Oh, sorry, that shouldn't have happened. Here we go. One was for northern Sweden, for the Arbisco station, where I worked for 14 years. The background is the temperature of the, the northern world between 1951 to 1980. And that is a climate envelope that has existed for all that period in the north of Sweden. Within the last 10 years, that climate envelope has moved five degrees latitude south. When we look at the projections, by the year 2091 to 2099, it will move 18 degrees southwards. That's the north of Sweden. If we now look at that red dot, it's Salikard in the Yamal area. It's an area of continuous permafrost and tundra environments, and the white line is its climatic envelope for 1951 to 1980. Within the last 10 years, that climate envelope and Sally Card's experience of climate has moved south again about five degrees. And this is where it's expected to be, Sally Card, in terms of a climate envelope within 100 years' time. Not the continuous permafrost zone of tundra, but the Central Asian steppes zone. These are huge changes and bring major concerns with them. And at the beginning of our conference, we heard about the urgency. I think if this doesn't represent urgency, nothing else does. We have to cope with these enormous changes. And what we're doing in terms of observation needs to be promoted, but only with attribution. Without attribution, it doesn't mean anything. Thank you for your attention.